Hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for the Untangle Tech Talk webinar series. Today we'll be discussing um, some of the technical features for our web filter application. My name is Shannon Miles and I'm part of the product marketing team here at Untangle and I'll be your host today. I also have with us John Coffin who's our director of QA and he'll be going through this presentation and giving us a demonstration of the application and of course answering any questions along the way. Uh, just a few housekeeping rules before we get started. Um, if you have any audio issues, please be sure you are selecting the correct preference on the right-hand side. If you do opt to use a, a telephone, you will need to dial in and use the access code that is provided. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded, so you'll be able to rewatch or share this webinar with any of your colleagues um, and rewatch it at your own convenience. And as always, we'll be answering questions throughout the presentation, so please be sure to submit, th submit those th through the questions box on the right-hand side. And if you have a very specific question um, about your network or a sales question or anything, you can always email us at sales at untangle.com or support at untangle.com. Uh, now, before I pass this over to John, I just want to reiterate, um, this is a highly technical webinar. So if you're not familiar with Untangle and our NG Firewall solution or networking concepts, then this may not be the best webinar for you. We do have a 101 webinar series that cover higher level topics, and you can find a full list of those webinars on our website at untangle.com. And with that, I'll pass it over to John. Thanks, Shannon. Appreciate that. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. Uh, Web Filter is probably one of our most popular applications. Um, it's the number one reason people usually get some kind of, uh, you know, unified firewall application. Um, some of the reasons for using uh, Web Filter to, you know, you can monitor and block inappropriate content depending on your regulations and rules or whatever you want to do. Um, we also comply with the uh, Children's Internet Protection Act, uh, so if you have the web filter in there, you'll be able to uh, select all the categories that you're able to, uh, that you should block for those areas. Um, we also protect against malware and bot sites, so one of the number one ways people get viruses on their computer is they go to a, a website, and websites now incorporate multiple sites uh, develop, uh, delivering content to one page. So while the page you go to might be uh, okay to go, they might have ads or they've had some kind of injection uh, causing ads to appear that will cause malware on your site. Um, web filter will also block that, so it works very well. Um, our web filter is powered by Zivilo. They're a member of the IFO. They're an uh, organization uh, looking to make sure to keep the uh, sites clean and um, certain uh, categorizations that are proper for classifying sites. Um, and Untangle also uh, provides compliance with multiple organizations, not only here in the U.S., but um, overseas, like the U.K. Um, Safer Internet Center. So there's over uh, 140 categories, and all those, uh, there's over uh, 450 million categorized websites um, in various languages. We're able to cover that. Um, high degree of accuracy on the active web. Uh, it also uses proprietary IE uh, learning machine to categorize engines very quickly and push those out, and the URLs are updated on a daily basis, if not even more. Um, with all the trends now to websites going to HTTPS, which is a secured uh, protocol, um, WebFilter does provide scanning of those sites. Uh, we're able to see the domain of those encrypted sites and um, evaluate those towards our categories and the categories that you've decided either to flag or to block. So um, if you want to go into more depth on the um, scanning of websites that are encrypted, you'll have to use our SSL inspector to get the full URL that's being inspected and um, going to. And there's a separate webinar uh, because it's quite lengthy uh, to get that in place. The SSL inspector requires installation of certificates on each PC. 
With the web filter, um, you do get a degree of scanning on those without any uh, extra work on each of the individual PCs behind the untangle. Uh, we use something that's called the SNI headers, and that is the header on the encrypted package that tells you the website it's going to by, by the domain. And we're able to look at that and categorize based on that. Let's uh, go ahead and take a look at WebFilter. So uh, right here, I just, uh, real simple setup. I only have WebFilter in this case set up. And I have my reporting because what's good blocking is something if you don't know it's blocked. So reporting is a key component here. So right off the bat, uh, you'll have uh, categories blocked that are normally uh, all your uh, malware, bot sites, uh, any kind of pornography and so forth uh, will be blocked uh, normally. Uh, so once I get my untangle set up, um, immediately I'm able to block areas. So for example, if I try to go uh, playboy.com, I get the block page right away without making any changes. Uh, this is just right out of the box. If I want to do something a little more complex, uh, let's say I'm going to go ahead and block new sites. So I'll go ahead and check that so my new sites are blocked. Uh, right now I just have this set up. So I'm going to go ahead and save that. So now when I go to CNN.com, I get the blog page or any other news site. Um, so what if I don't want people going to news sites, but I, I don't mind that they actually go to uh, CNN.com? So I'll go ahead and add this. It's really simple. Let me just go ahead and delete this and start from scratch. So I just say the website I want to go to, CNN.com, and I'll just write some description. And I'll go ahead and save that. And now I'm able to go to CNN.com and click on my news stories and read those uh, like I normally would. But other news sites are still blocked. So those, those are already blocked and set for good. So other things I can do. Um, I can also block individual sites. Um, for example, let's say I uh, want to block uh, access to uh, Yahoo, for example. So I'll go ahead and just put Yahoo in here. And I can actually block an individual site. I get the block page that I get. So let's say um, I have a different, um, it's not a very large group, so I don't want to go into making separate uh, policies and so forth. Um, so I just want to make some simple rules. So uh, for example, the head of staff can still go to yahoo.com, for example. So what I'll do is I'll go over here, advance, and I'll say unblock temporary, and I'm going to require a password. And I'm going to put a password in there and say, um, you know, how about let me see. So I'll go ahead and save that. So now when I go to a website that is blocked, it will give me um, a little question here. It says, you know, uh, it's blocked and it says uh, for password, you can unblock it. So I'll go ahead and put in my password that I entered before, and I'll go ahead and unblock it. I must have typed it in wrong. Let's take a look here. Ah, 
must be some reason I'm blocking. Anyway, so you can add uh, temporary or you can make it permanent. So if someone finds a site that uh, they do want the staff to go to, you can do what's called a permanent global change where you can make those changes permanently and um, everyone will have access to that. So it's really, generally you're going to use temporary, uh, but you can use uh, permanent global. So you can give it to like IT staff that so they, instead of having to go in here and make past sites, they can just actually go to that website and enter the password and they can make that as a global change to the pass list. Um, you can also pass um, individual people directly if you know the IP address of that machine. So I'll say, um, you know, this particular box, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and let it access the sites that it wants to. So. So now when I go to, it lets me in because I'm in the pass list. And we can actually see that in reports itself. So if we go to um, all web events, uh, you can see right here Yahoo and that it's in the client pass list. And that's what lets me go through. And you can see in this case, uh, Yahoo was uh, in the block light list, so that was blocked. Hey, John, that's why we have sure. some, sorry, we just have some questions about the blocking since you're on it right now. Um, someone is saying um, they're having issues with one site that Untangle is blocking, um, and that even though they're putting it as a whitelisted website, um, it's still being blocked. What else can be done um, to help that? Yeah, one of the things you can do, um, like today's sites uh, come from multiple sources. So one of the things to do is do look at your ports and look to see um, why it's being blocked. Because for example, um, even though I went, I typed yahoo.com at the other one, see I'm also getting um, content for that same site at a different domain, which in this case is this uh, Insight Express. Um, I'm also getting uh, contact that's coming from the scorecard and uh, you can see like uh, even Yahoo has separate domains like their images all come from yimage.com and you know so forth so you really have to kind of go through the web events and see if a particular site is uh, being blocked and one interesting way to do it and this is sometimes hard to do in a multiple environment is I can go ahead and say, you know, let's just look at the test machine that I'm using. So what I'll do is I'll put my address in here. So now I only have web events from a test box that, I'm, that I have on, behind Untangle. So it's easier for me to, to figure out where I'm getting blocks. In this case, they're all being passed. But um, a lot of times what happens is, uh, for example, if we go into web filter and we go into categories, and let's say we just select them all, and then we do a white list, which is the past sites, which sites we're going to go through, that's going to become very cumbersome because today's websites are really not a one source for content. Most websites have at least, you know, four or five uh, other websites that they're collecting data to when you display their page. Um, one way to see it is, is um, you can go ahead, um, if you get in the developer mode of your web browser, usually it's F12. Um, and then you go ahead and uh, reload the page. You'll be able to see all the domains that this is going to. And you can see, uh, look for any errors, like you get a 404 or, or 500. Uh, those are going to be areas that are blocked on your web browser. And that will tell you what domains you need to 
be whitelisting. For example, you know, if um, if I was, uh, let's just take a quick look. Oh, this is also an interesting thing. So let's say you have a website and you want to know what category because you want to block all those kinds of websites. So I'll go ahead and just type in the website and do a search here. So this is a content server. So if I go over here and block content servers real quick, and let's go ahead and refresh this page. So what we're doing here is we actually have a reference Let's see where that content's coming from. So that's one of the things to look at is look at the reports, um, see what's being blocked, and then uh, that should be able to help you whitelist whatever you need to do to get that website uh, available. That works really well. Um, some of the other things you can do in WebFilter, for example, is um, we talked about whitelisting. Oh, that's why I was being passed over because the way it works is um, categories are looked for at first to see if they're blocked. But if there's any pass rules that evaluate true for that person, that will be um, done first. So let's say you block something or even block a specific site. But if you have a, either a pass rule, pass site rule, or a pass client rule, that will override the blocks. That's why I wasn't getting the proper. So now we can see that Yahoo's blocked because I have the content filters blocked. So what I have to do is go ahead and then look at my sites to see what's uh, being blocked. So let's see past sites. Uh, let's go back here. Get that there. Oh, that's right. We didn't uh, we didn't add that to a past site. So we can put Yahoo. So now we, we can actually go through and see what content is being, um, other content that's being blocked and whitelist those. So that's the different things you can do. Um, you know, if you can look, um, if you find a site um, that is miscategorized, you can do a lookup for that and it actually suggest something else. You know, you can say, um, you know, this is more of a portal site. Uh, and then you can submit those results, and then those will be evaluated to see if that is true and the site is miscategorized. Uh, so you can look at all those other different things. Um, one of the most uh, advanced part on version 13.1 is that now you can create complex rules for blocking and passing. Um, you could do a rule like, for example, uh, let's take a look here. Um, Let's delete that rule. Let's just verify this is blocked now. Uh, one other thing to be very careful is um, when your web browser is caching, uh, you do have to clear the cache to verify it. So currently Yahoo is blocked. So I can do a complex rule like this. Um, it's not what I want. I can do something like uh, when the um, source address, which is the, my box, and this is kind of a simple rule. I, I could have just added this as a uh, past client, but I'm going to make a, a little more complicated rule. I'm going to say um, 
you know, when the host name is yahoo.com, I'm going to go ahead and pass that. So here I can um, allow access to one website only to one client behind there. And that's the power of these new uh, rules where you can make complex rules for difficult situations that normally you would have to create multiple policies and have multiple versions of a web filter on each of the policies. So we'll save that and then Let's change that a little. Let's find out where it is here. Yeah, we can just say uh, category, and in there we'll type in, um, let's see. Okay, so we're just going to do this, go over here, we'll go to portal sites and we're going to say pass. So let's see how, if I got that rule. So there's a little bit of experimenting to do on those websites. So let me take a look. Um, we'll go over my web filter rules, we'll take a look at the rules, and um, so this is the more complicated parts of it. So you, you get areas where um, there's sub areas blocked and then they can't get to those uh, particular areas because they have something in the engine requiring it to um, be blocked for that. So that's, that's the process you have to go through. You have to go through, see if your areas are um, blocked and then go through there. So let's take the HBS off. Okay, so we do get the proper rule. And it should be passing me because I have the right thing. So let's take a look at the rule again. So this is how you build the rules, and then um, there's a little bit of art to them because the more complicated the rule, the harder it gets. So you need to use the reports area to get those, uh, to find out what's being blocked exactly. So if we look right here, it looks like the rule is a little bit behind. So some of the other things that we can do with web filter. Um, like I said, you can process the certificate of information to find out what websites it's going through, and that's on by default. This will check for HTTPS traffic. Um, you can do something a little more complicated and actually uh, check the IP also besides the SSL. This is more difficult because a lot of web browsers, there's multiple web browsers on one IP address. Uh, they do that with something called virtual host on uh, Apache sites. So um, I generally recommend that you don't check this and now you're having a very difficult time blocking uh, secured websites. Um, this will help you out a lot. Of things. Uh, also blocking uh, pages by IP address only. Again, um, this is in cases where you're having a very difficult time blocking certain encrypted sites. But I generally don't recommend it unless you're trying to solve a, a problem by blocking encrypted websites. Uh, restricted uh, Google app applications. That's this is another one. Um, so, if you want uh, to block, uh, for example, access to Gmail.com, but your school email is on Google uh, Gmail, what you can do is you can say that. Um, you want to block um, everything except for your specific site. So you'll say, you know, uh, for example, you, you can say, um, 
and Tangle.com can access it. So even though uh, we use uh, gmail.com, we can access that because it's under our subdomain. And that's a way to get around some of the uh, restrictions of using Google products but still being able to uh, access those uh, with your own domain. Do we have any other uh, questions out there? Yeah, John. Um, someone was asking, um, they were having some issues blocking uh, pornography images and stuff on when they're on Google searches. Um, so I believe uh, you were, that's requiring SSL inspector, correct? Yeah, there's a combination of things that you can do. Uh, first, make sure that you have the block QVC. This is a way that Google does to uh, send the images over there. Uh, if you're not blocking this, uh, those images are not scanned, what they're coming from. Also, um, yeah, it's if you really uh, want to clamp down on some of the searches and so forth, I do recommend putting SSL Inspector in. It will provide a lot more uh, degree of uh, being able to filter those areas. Again, uh, once you go with SSL Inspector, um, it definitely raises the amount of uh, effort on part of the IT staff to get that um, implemented correctly, because it does require the uh, implementation of a certificate on each PC that's behind it. Okay. Um... Is it possible to block mature content on YouTube without implementing DNS workarounds? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah, is it possible to block mature content on YouTube without implementing DNS workarounds? Uh, there is a way. Um, you can uh, restrict um, Google applications to your domain and then signed up what's known as YouTube for Education. And then they only allow um, videos you approve on to be accessed through your Google services. So this requires that your uh, content is you have a Google account and that you're able to share that through your own domain. And then you can restrict the, the uh, videos being shown uh, to strictly your logins. But definitely look at uh, YouTube for education. Uh, they have a way of blocking uh, videos and so forth going forward. Um, let's see. Um, does SSL Inspector handle HSTS traffic? Yes. Yes, it will handle any kind of encrypted traffic. Um, most of that is uh, in, it. It's just a, an overriding protocol on the HTTPS. So let's see how we're doing here. We covered that. Um, some of the things on web filter, uh, on the reports. Um, definitely uh, one of the things I usually look at is looking at top categories where everyone's going to um, see if there's an issue there, uh, looking at my websites. Um, see if the bandwidth is being used. Um, of course, uh, Windows Update, uh, it's kind of a normal one for it that you'll see a lot of bandwidth. But you kind of want to go through and just see where a lot of your bandwidth is going and see if it's appropriate. Uh, you can also look at your top uh, blocked um, host names and, or IPs addresses uh, just because um, it kind of gives you an idea of which ones are being blocked and which ones are not. Uh, and maybe you have some problem with one particular person on your network. Uh, some of the other things to look at is um, top content, uh, just the type of applications that are being blocked. Um, see if it's you know generally what you want in your particular network. Um, the rest of these for events are really good for debugging your particular rules. What rules you want to block, you'll see what's actually happening, what web filter actually sees and what it's deciding to block and unblock and the reasons for that. And that's a really important thing to look at. Uh, one question 
uh, popped in, John. Um, is there a way to send an email alert um, for someone trying to access a specific type of website? Oh, good, good question. Um, I should have brought that up. So, yeah, you can definitely do something like in the administrative alerts. Um, So uh, one of the more common ones is, um, it, and it's actually built into Untangle, is if someone goes to a malware distribution site, it's going to send an email. It's going to trigger an email here. Uh, you can say, uh, for example, um, so you can take a rule like this, for example, and we'll just copy it. Uh, we don't want that one. We want this one. So we'll go ahead and modify this. And let's say uh, we're interested if somebody goes to a um, shopping website. So if it's a web event, um, and if it's uh, you know true, blocked is true, uh, we can see if they're going to actually, um, we actually want is blocked. Uh, we'll send an email out if they are particularly going to that website. Whether and you can you can decide whether it's blocked or not. Um, you can say I really don't care. I just want to know if somebody's going to a shopping website. So you can go ahead and go to that. And that's just one of them that you can go through. You can look. Uh, you know, if someone is going at um, you know some violent websites, if they're going to a weapons website, things like that you can have emails sent directly to you. That was a great question. And again, that's under config and then events. And the easiest way is just take one of the alert rules that's similar to one of yours and do a copy and then add what you want to do for it. Um, some other things you can do, you can actually look on your um, dashboard to see what some of the web requests are going through, how much web usage you have. That's a kind of a straight, you know, front page thing. You can see what's going live. Any other questions? Um, yeah. um, there's a question about reports saying what's kind of the best strategy uh, to drill down on information for reports. Sure. Um, so on um, on information, um, a lot of times using the time zones, um, anytime you add conditions to this bottom area, it it carries throughout the different reports. As you see, as I click on the different reports, I do get uh, volume on that. Um, for example, if you're looking at categories um, and you're like, wow, someone's like watching a lot of news. So what I can do is go down here to my web events, and I can add a combination of rules. Um, let's go ahead and delete this rule. And let's say um, I'm interested in um, I'm going to be interested in the web events, um, and I'm interested in a category, and say um, I want to see who's going to news. So I can go ahead and add that, and then that will quickly show me a list of everything. I can also go over here to top clients, and this shows me all the clients that are going to a news website. So you can see that these conditions at the bottom affect all the different types of reports that you can get. You can see which uh, news websites they're going to, things like that. So that works out really well. Uh, definitely use the conditions at the bottom to narrow down your scope. You can also narrow down the time by quite a bit. Uh, for example, let's say you know we're only interested in um, today from eight o'clock, and then we can you know really narrow the time scope of when we're actually interested in that. So between the conditions at the bottom and the time reports, you'll find that really useful in finding. You'll notice the time reports carries between each report. And then on adding on to that, can you then save those um, conditions for future use? 
Yeah, that uh, the times you probably don't want to keep for future use. Um, you can actually download the data uh, directly. Uh, for example, like if you're interested in this data uh, based on these reports on this time, uh, I can go ahead and export that data into a spreadsheet. So I get that uh, all set. Or I can, um, if I have like a special report, let's say I, I want to modify a report here. Um, I can go ahead and make a special report. So right here, this is, uh, I don't want that one. Let's see. Um, let's say top flag sites here. I can go ahead and add conditions here. So I can go ahead and uh, I want a particular IP address added to that. And I'm going to make the IP address the one I'm interested in. So now I can go ahead and uh, let's make this let's change the title of this report. Uh, top flag categories for uh, dot 60. I'm going to save that as a new report. I, I added a, a dot to it, which uh, did not like it. So let's go ahead and modify that. But that's how you can save a particular report if you're looking for specifics, like in the future. And uh, we also have a webinar next month um, to go over reports, um, specifically, you know, everything you can do in reports, which includes the drill down and how to, you know, view all the custom and uh, default reports. So. Um, if you have further questions about reports, that would be a really great webinar for you to attend. Um, we can give you that information in our, our follow-up email that we'll send the recording in. Again, um, if you are have problems with reports and you want to, um, you know, you're having problems troubleshooting, definitely post your uh, SQL rules or your particular uh, rules that you're putting in web filter to the um, forums and we're more than glad to help you out uh, you know tuning your rules and getting those defined great thanks John um, yes we're gonna have webinars on how to create report um, both high-level as well as deep deep dive um, so you can look at those web webinars on our website um, and we'll be coming up with new ones um, for 2018 as well. So if you have any specific uh, webinars that you're interested in and topics that we have not covered, um, please just give us a, a shout um, on the forums or, or email us um, and, and let us know uh, what you're interested in. And yes, the webinar is recorded and will be sent out um, within 24 hours after this has ended. Um, just to wrap things up, uh, if you're having any confusion or questions about help, you know, just installing Untangle or the web filter or configuration settings, um, we do offer professional services if you're completely lost. So um, that's always available for you. Um, if you need some assistance, you can contact us at sales.untangle.com to get more information about that. Um, Let's see, there is a one question, John, that came up about what the difference is between web monitor and web filter. Right, so um, really web filter and web monitor are very similar except for one crucial detail, and that is web monitor does not block websites. So you can see that people are going to certain sites, but you can't do anything to block them from going to those sites, and that's the critical difference. It uses the same database engine, everything, except you're not able to block uh, websites with um, Web Monitor. Great. 
Thanks, John. Um, so, as John mentioned, you know, um, please, if you have any issues or questions, um, you can email us at salesentangle.com, supportedentangle.com. We have a variety of resources. The forums is our open community where you can ask us questions as well as other users. Our wiki is our technical documentation. Um, so, uh, a lot of what John mentioned today is on our wiki. Um, our next webinars, as I mentioned, um, Tech Talks uh, reports. So I know there were a lot of questions on reports, so John's going to go into kind of a deep dive in all the default reports that are available and how you can kind of view all the data. And then um, later in November, uh, our 101 series, which I mentioned earlier as well, is more high level um, for an introduction of, of, of Untangle. So if, you're, if you have someone that is not aware of Untangle and you think it would be a good fit for them, um, please pass along this info. Um, you can find all our webinars on our website. And I believe that's all the questions. Um, if we didn't get to your question, or if you have a very specific question, please contact us at, at supportedentangle.com. We'd be glad to answer those questions. Um, thanks, John, for the great demo, and we hope to see you next time. <laughs>